at that point, even I tell people today, Steph is probably the best, best point guard I've ever seen play up close. To me, I think he's the best no. New York point no, guard ever. Ever. One of the best in a long line of storied New York point guards, Stephon Marbury was among the most popular rookies in the legendary 1996 draft. He was part of the new generation of point guard that could score like a two guard, but still pass like a traditional point guard. He wasn't the greatest shooter, but he could make it. He had the athleticism to play above the rim and had top-notch finishing ability. He pushed the ball in transition like a freight train, but had the control to stop on a dime for a quick pull-up or hesitation dribble. His first step was dangerous, and he would barrel through the lane like a fullback, yet finish with the softest touch. And although he was one of the best scoring guards of his era, what made him the most unique was that he put up assist numbers on par with the best passers in the league. His passes had flair, yet retained accuracy. And this complete package made him a fan favorite most of his career. A potential duo with Kevin Garnett didn't happen in Minnesota, then the rest of his career would see him putting up big numbers on bad teams in New Jersey, Phoenix, and New York. But by the end of his time in New York, he was known more as a player constantly feuding with coaches. And this, along with a historic post-NBA career in China, leads to recency bias, which overlooks how good of a player Stefan Marbury was for nearly his entire NBA career. But Starberry was a basketball icon on a global scale, and he needs to be talked about. Let's jog your memory. By the time Steph began his career at Lincoln High School, the Marbury name was already well known, as he was one of many Marbury brothers who were New York basketball stars. But Steph was the best. He would begin his Lincoln career as a 5'8", 140-pound freshman, but by his junior year, he had sprouted to 6'2", 175 pounds. And already as just a teenager, his game was seamless, as not only could he do it all on the offensive end, but when he wanted to, Marbury could lock you up on defense. Overall, as a junior, he put up 26 points per game while shooting 45% from deep, and would also average 8.5 assists and 3.5 steals, while being named a parade first team All-American. But it wasn't just on the court that he stood out, as his Coney Island neighborhood awarded him for being a great role model. But going into his senior season at Lincoln, his name was included among other great New York point guards, like Mark Jackson, Rod Strickland, and Kenny Anderson. However, there were plenty of people who thought Marbury stood above them all. Marbury would make his college choice during his senior year, which had him following in the footsteps of one of those great New York guards, as he chose to attend Georgia Tech, where Kenny Anderson had spent two years. As Marbury would say that Georgia Tech knew how to treat their point guards. His senior season would live up to expectation as he captured all the big awards, such as the Gatorade National Player of the Year, Mr. New York Basketball, a McDonald's All-American, and again a First Team Parade All-American. After losing in the final of the PSAL the past two seasons, Lincoln would defeat Robeson in the final, behind 26 points from Marbury. He then led Lincoln High to the Class A State Championship game versus Christ the King, where he scored 21 first half points to help the rail splitters to a big lead. But the Royals came back and tied it in the fourth quarter before Marbury led an 11-2 run as Lincoln ultimately won 55-52, with his legendary high school career ending on a high note. Marbury had a violation scare during the summer as he was gifted a car by the founder of the New York Gauchos AAU team, Lou Almeida, for passing his college entry exam, which seemed to be a violation of amateur status, but the NCAA would rule that it was not a violation with Almeida saying that he was acting as a longtime friend, fulfilling a promise. Marbury was the starring attraction at Georgia Tech immediately, but they had a solid team in place before he arrived, as they featured multiple future NBA players in Matt Harpering and Drew Barry, as these three would combine to average over 50 points per game on one of the highest scoring teams in the nation, while also each averaging 1.8 steals per game. Marbury would finish third in the ACC in scoring and fifth in assists, while leading the conference in made field goals and three-pointers. He would earn a first-team all-conference selection as well as ACC Rookie of the Year, as overall he was one of the best freshmen in the nation. Georgia Tech would have the hardest-ranked schedule in the nation in 96, and that was clear in the first half of the season, as going into the new year, they were 6-7 and seven and had lost four straight. But they would go 7-2 and two in January, which included back-to-back -back wins, first versus 19th-ranked Duke, and then the second versus 10th-ranked North Carolina. They would begin February with a loss to Maryland, but after that they would finish the regular season on a 7-game win streak, which included wins over ranked opponents like Wake Forest and Maryland. Overall, they would finish at 20-10, and 10, 
as well as first in the ACC at 13-3. And, and after defeating NC State and Maryland in the ACC tournament, they would get a conference championship matchup with Wake Forest, led by Tim Duncan. The Yellow Jackets would fall behind, as they trailed by 18 with less than 15 minutes remaining. But they would charge back and ultimately have a chance to win, with the ball in Marbury's hands. But his game-winning attempt would hit the side of the backboard, and even though Georgia Tech got one last half-court heave from Barry, it was no good, as Wake Forest won by a point, with Marbury scoring a team-high 26 points. But the Yellow Jackets still did enough for a tournament bid, where they would defeat Austin P in round one, as Marbury had 17 points and 7 assists on about 43% shooting. The second round versus Boston College would be Marbury's best, as he had a game-high 29 points on 10 of 12 shooting, to go along with 9 assists and 4 steals in a win. But Georgia Tech's season came to an end in the Sweet 16, as the whole team struggled on offense, and Marbury had just 15 points on 4 of 13 shooting, in a loss to Cincinnati. So the freshman sensation ended his first season averaging about 19 points, 4.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. But that's all Georgia Tech fans were going to get, as shortly after the season wrapped up, Marbury announced his intention to leave for the NBA. Marbury was even being considered as the number one pick, as the Philadelphia 76ers had received the first overall pick and were in desperate need of a point guard. So it was between Marbury and Georgetown's Allen Iverson. Yet as most know, Iverson would become a Sixer, but Marbury wasn't sitting around long. With the fourth pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Stephon Marbury. So Marbury was taken fourth overall by the Bucks with a great shooter being selected by the Timberwolves right after him in Ray Allen. But hold up, looks like there's a trade to announce. Milwaukee conveys the draft rights to Stephon Marbury to Minnesota in exchange for the draft rights to Ray Allen. Minnesota needed a point guard, but more specifically, they needed Marbury, as they had a second year forward who looked like a star in the making in Kevin Garnett, and the two knew each other dating back to before either of them were in the NBA. With the two developing a friendship talking on the phone, then even in their first pickup game, just minutes after meeting in person for the first time, Garnett and Marbury had special chemistry. A chemistry that would translate seamlessly to the NBA. But before we get to that, Marbury also needs to be recognized for putting the and one brand on the map. As coming into the NBA, he decided to sign with the three-year-old apparel brand over all the other big names, eventually releasing the Marbury Ones and kickstarting the brand whose popularity grew immensely during the 2000s, thanks in no small part to Stefan Marbury. But back to the association. Marbury and Garnett were one of the hottest young duos in the league and the passion and flair they played with made Minnesota one of the league's most exciting young teams, as it seemed only a matter of time before they would be challenging for a championship. On top of these two, the T-Wolves also featured an underrated 50-year forward in Tom Gugliotta, as these three made up one of the league's best young cores. Together they would combine to average over 53 points per game, with Marbury also leading the team in assists at nearly 8 per game. And on top of leading his team in assists, he would also lead all rookies in that category, while finishing 5th among rookies in scoring, as he would be named 1st team all-rookie and finished 2nd to Iverson in Rookie of the Year voting. But again, going back to his passing, Marbury had quickly established himself as one of the league's best passers, finishing with the 10th best assist average in the NBA, as he often made the right pass and could wow fans with his flair, and his elite ability to penetrate would also lead to open teammates once the defense collapsed. And when he had a guy like Garnett on the receiving end, it was always a threat for a highlight. Marbury would sprain his ankle in the season opener and miss the next 8 games, but he was mostly healthy after that, and would hit double figures in 56 games, including 2 games with at least 30, while recording double digit assists in 18 games and 15 double doubles. But with the addition of Marbury, alongside the improved play of Garnett and Gugliotta, the T-Wolves put together their best season in franchise history, and their 40-42 and 42 record would get them their first postseason appearance, as they would take on a veteran Rockets team in Round 1. This series went as expected, with Houston's experience being too much, as they swept Minnesota. Marbury didn't have the most efficient shooting series, but he would lead Minnesota in scoring and assists over the three games. He would have a game-high 28 on nearly 53% shooting in Game 1, then a game-high 22 on just 40% shooting in Game 2. His worst shooting performance came in Game 3, when he had just 14 points on 6 of 21 shooting, but he would make up for it with 13 assists. So Minnesota's season was over, but their future was bright, 
as Marbury finished his rookie year averaging about 16 points, 8 assists, and a steal per game. The 98 Timberwolves brought back the same trio as the three would combine to average over 56 points per game. Additionally, they would get a great year out of veteran backup point guard Terry Porter and would make a mid-season trade with Vancouver for veteran shooter Anthony Peeler. Marbury upped his assist to 8.6 per game, which again led the team and would be the fourth highest average in the league. Marbury would hit double figures in 72 games, including five games with at least 30. He would also record 31 games with at least 10 assists and 27 double doubles including a 38-point, 10-assist performance in a November 24th loss to Utah. The T-Wolves were improving, yet it was more so due to their duo of Marbury and Garnett, as Gugliotta would miss the entire second half of the season with bone spurs. The T-Wolves were 25-18 when Gugliotta was shut down, but would go 20-19 the rest of the way, to finish at 45-37 and, and get a first-round matchup with Seattle. They would again fail to make it out of the first round, but after a blowout loss in Game 1, Marbury would score a team-high 25 points along with 7 assists to lead Minnesota to the franchise's first playoff victory in Game 2. He would follow that up with a 14-point, 11-assist double-double in Game 3, as the T-Wolves would win again to lead the series 2-1, but Seattle would win the final two games to take the series as Marbury averaged 8.5 points on a combined 6 of 26 shooting, with 5 turnovers in games 4 and 5. However, he also averaged 7.5 assists and 3.5 steals in those games. But overall, Marbury's second year saw him average about 17.5 points, 8.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. And prior to the 98 season, Garnett had signed a 6-year, $126 million extension. And big contracts like this were part of the reason that NBA owners called for a lockout going into the 99 season. The Timberwolves especially had cause for concern, as yes, they had locked up Garnett, but Marbury was reportedly planning to ask for an equally large contract when his rookie deal expired at the end of the 99 season. And they also had to worry about Gugliotta, who had a price tag of 70 to 80 million and was a current free agent. Shortly before the lockout ended, Gugliotta announced he would not be re-signing with the team and would eventually sign with Phoenix. So now the T-Wolves' future consisted of Marbury and their $100 million man, Garnett. And the season started with both of them playing great. The two were combining for over 38 points per game, and Marbury was having one of his best passing seasons, averaging over 9 assists per game. But he was struggling with his efficiency, which would be one of the biggest knocks on his career, as he was only shooting about 40% from the field and 20% from deep. However, he would have a 40-point, 12-assist, and 0-turnover performance in a February 17th win versus Houston becoming just the fifth player in history at the time to go for at least 40 points, 10 assists, and zero turnovers in a game. But then after just 18 games, with Minnesota sitting at 12-6, and six, the Timberwolves' once bright future got darker. Marbury would be part of a three-team blockbuster point guard trade, which saw him go much closer to home and end up as a member of the New Jersey Nets. Although Minnesota still offered him a max deal under the new CBA worth about $70 million, it would never be Garnett money. And after declining that, it was clear he would not be a T-Wolf after the season, so they had to avoid losing him for nothing. And as far as reasons for Marbury not taking that deal go, Marbury's been criticized by Garnett for ruining their championship dreams due to him being unhappy playing in Garnett's shadow, which Gugliotta would also speak to shortly after he left for Phoenix saying that it killed Marbury to see Garnett get the money, the all-star recognition, and the future shot at the Olympics, which made Steph want to leave even more so he could go somewhere else and be the man. Additionally, Gugliotta would also add that Marbury constantly talked about returning to New York so he could be in a major market and maximize his promos and endorsement potential. Marbury has never said much on the subject, but around the time of the trade, he would keep it a lot more simple only saying that it came down to him not wanting to spend the next 7 years of his life in Minnesota. Another interesting asterisk on this trade is that it was originally a 4-team deal, with Miami and Vancouver instead of New Jersey, which would have seen Marbury end up in Miami. But Miami pulled out after Marbury's agent explained that Marbury was set on a return to New York. But now he was going to be wowing fans in his home state for the foreseeable future. Almost immediately, the Nets inked Marbury to a 6-year, $70.9 million deal, as Marbury was joining a 3-15 Nets team in the midst of an 8-game losing streak. The Nets had some solid pieces like Keith Van Horn, Kerry Kittles, and Kendall Gill, but none of those names carried the same weight as Stephon Marbury, so he was getting his wish of being the star of a team, and in his 31 games for New Jersey, he would play as such, as he averaged over 23 points per game to lead the team while continuing his great passing 
as his 8.7 assists would also lead the team. He would record his only 20 and 20 game in an April 25th win versus Indiana, when he had 26 points and a career high 20 assists. Additionally, he would put together a 41 point, 11 assist, and one turnover double double in a May 5th win versus Milwaukee. And I couldn't find a definitive answer, but if it's not the first, that's got to be one of the only times a player has recorded at least 40 points and 10 assists for two different teams in the same season. And more impressively, he did it in a 50 game season. Marbury looked great in his 31 games with New Jersey as he upped his shooting to nearly 44% from the field and nearly 37% from deep, and overall would finish the season as a top 10 scorer in the league and top 3 distributor. But the Nets were an average offensive team with a poor defense, and would go 13-18 and after the Marbury trade to finish at 16-34 and and miss the playoffs. But Marbury's overall season saw him average about 21.5 points, 9 assists, and a steal per game. Going into 2000, the Nets didn't look much different, but maybe with a full season of Marbury as their leader, things would change. Marbury and Keith Van Horn would form a good scoring duo, averaging over 41 points per game combined, as Marbury had a then career high scoring average and field goal percentage, and his team leading 8.4 assists would also be a top 10 mark in the league. But outside of their duo, the Nets didn't have much, as they had lost big man Jason Williams last year to what ended up being a career ending injury. And after leading the league in steals last year, veteran swingman Kendall Gill would have his final good season this year. Marbury began the year on a high note with 39 points in a season opening loss to Indiana, as overall he would hit double figures in 71 games, including 13 games with at least 30, while also recording 29 double doubles. But as defenses focused on him, he would struggle more with turnovers, as his 270 turnovers this year would be 5th most in the league. Nonetheless, Marbury would be voted 3rd team All-NBA, but the Nets would only manage a 31-51 record, which wouldn't be enough for the playoffs, as for the season, he averaged about 22 points, 8.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. The Nets got good and bad off-season news. To give the bad news first, Kerry Kittles underwent cartilage resurfacing surgery, which would ultimately force him to sit out all of 2001. But shortly after this surgery, the Nets selected Kenyon Martin first overall in the draft, and Marbury's passing, along with Martin's athleticism and dunking, looked like an exciting combination. Unfortunately, it would be another disappointing season in New Jersey. Martin had a good rookie year, but Gill dealt with injuries which led to a big drop in his production, and injuries also limited Van Horn to just 49 games. So this left a lot of the responsibility on Marbury, and he responded by putting together arguably the best pro season of his career. He averaged 7.6 assists per game, which was a then career low, yet still a top 10 mark in the NBA. But with so many of his best scores often being injured or out altogether, this was quite impressive. Yet New Jersey needed to get the scoring from somewhere, and Marbury would provide it, with a career-high 23.9 points per game on a then-career-high 44.1% from the field and nearly 33% from deep. He would have just 9 points on 3 of 17 shooting in the season opener, but after that would hit double figures in every game he played in the rest of the season which included his career-high scoring mark of 50 points on 17 of 29 shooting to go along with 12 assists in a February 13th loss to the Lakers. He would still manage 11 double-doubles and record his first career triple-double in a January 20th win versus Chicago when he had 33 points, 11 rebounds, and 12 assists. And his incredible season saw him earn his first career All-Star selection in what would be a legendary All-Star game as the East trailed by 21 points with about 9 minutes left in the game but a furious comeback would see them win by a point, as Marbury would hit a game-tying three-pointer in the final minute. Then after Kobe put the West up by two with about 30 seconds left, Marbury looked like he was going to drive for a game-tying shot, but then he decided to go for the win. Stirring finish to this 50th NBA All-Star game, the West by two, Marbury for three, again! Stephon Marbury! Marbury would hit a go-ahead three with under 30 seconds left, which ended up being the game winner, as the East completed the comeback, with Marbury putting up 12 points and 4 assists. But that would be one of the only times that Marbury could celebrate this season, as the Nets finished at 26-56 and 56 and missed the playoffs, as Marbury averaged about 24 points, 7.5 assists, and a steal per game. But after little success, the Nets had to make a change. Over the offseason, Marbury was the headliner in a package sent to Phoenix, for a package headlined by Jason Kidd. But it was rumored that a big reason for this trade, from the Suns' perspective, was Kidd being arrested in January, and Suns owner Jerry Colangelo not being happy about that. But the Nets needed rebounding, which Kidd could offer, and the Suns wanted more scoring, 
with Colangelo expressing excitement in what Marbury and their third-year forward Sean Marion could do. The 0-2 Suns began with Scott Skiles as head coach, but after a 25-25 start, he was replaced with Frank Johnson. And as far as their roster went outside of Marbury and Marion, they had a 30-year-old Penny Hardaway who would play his healthiest season in years, while also still featuring Marbury's former teammate in Tom Gugliotta, who at this point was a shell of his former self due to injuries. Additionally, after going 0-3 in their first games under Johnson, they made a February 20th trade with Boston for rookie shooting guard Joe Johnson. Marbury did his usual work this season, as he would have one of his healthiest years, playing all 82 games and leading the team in scoring and assists, as he and Marion combined for nearly 40 points per game. Marbury would be top 10 in assists, but getting used to new teammates and a new system led to him committing a career-high 284 turnovers which was the second most in the league, but he would still shoot over 44% from the field as he hit double figures in 76 games, including 9 games with at least 30, and 29 double-doubles. But his playoff drought would continue as the Suns finished at just 36-46, and 46, and Marbury's season saw him average about 20.5 points, 8 assists, and a steal per game. Phoenix made a big splash in the 0-2 draft as they selected high school phenom Amare Stoudemire 9th overall. So with the eventual Rookie of the Year Stoudemire, alongside Marion, and an improved Joe Johnson, Marbury had all the weapons he could ask for, and it would be a big test this year to see if he can lead a team to the playoffs. He would again be the team's top scorer and distributor, as he, Marion, and Stoudemire combined for 57 points per game. Marbury would still shoot nearly 44% from the field as a top 15 scorer in the league, and his 8.1 assists would be a top 5 mark in the league. He would hit double figures in 75 games, including 5 games with at least 40, while recording 23 double-doubles. And the Suns were looking good, as they were sitting at 29-21 and 21 going into the All-Star break, as both Marbury and Marion would be voted to the game, marking the second and final All-Star appearance of Marbury's career, as he would have 4 points and 6 assists in a double OT loss. The Suns would go 15-17 and 17 after the All-Star break, but at 44-38, and 38, it was enough for a playoff berth versus top-seeded San Antonio. Although San Antonio was the overwhelming favorite, Phoenix shocked them in Game 1, behind a 26-point and 6-assist performance from Marbury. It wasn't all great, as Marbury had shot 8-27 of 27 from the field and was 0-3 for 3 from deep in the final seconds of overtime with Phoenix trailing, but Marbury would have one more shot opportunity, and he made it count. It is up and it's not good, but the rebound's knocked to the side. Marbury has it. Marbury on the drive. Marbury puts a shot up. That goes! <laughs> it goes! So Phoenix shocked the Spurs in San Antonio, and Marbury would continue his strong play in Game 2, as he had 32 points and 10 rebounds in a loss, then followed that up with 25 points and 7 assists in another loss. Phoenix would even the series in Game 4, with Marbury putting up 18 points and 7 assists, but they would drop the next two as Marbury averaged 15.5 points and 5.5 turnovers on a combined 10 of 37 from the field in the final two games. It ended quickly, but Marbury still got them to the playoffs. And for his regular season, Marbury averaged about 22.5 points, 8 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. Phoenix looked the same to begin the 0-4 season, with one difference being that Joe Johnson was now a starter. Marbury was playing well, as he was again their leading scorer and distributor, while shooting about 43% from the field and 31% from deep. But the team had regressed, as they started the season at 8-13, and 13 before Frank Johnson was replaced with Mike D'Antoni. But even with the addition of D'Antoni, the Suns were sitting at 12-22 and 22 after 34 games. So on January 5th, they decided they needed to plan for the future. And even though Marbury was just 26 at the time of the trade, he was the oldest of their young core and had the biggest contract by far, as Phoenix had given him a 4-year extension worth about $80 million prior to the season. So he and Hardaway were packaged in a trade to New York, essentially as a salary dump, but it was a childhood dream come true for Marbury, as the New York native would finally get a chance to play for his hometown team. The Knicks were 14-21 and, and featured franchise mainstay Allen Houston, but at this point, injuries had made him a part-time player. In Marbury's 47 games for the team, he would put up nearly 20 points and 9 assists per game, as overall he would finish second in the league in assists per game this season. He would take a bit of time to get into the swing of things, but would find his groove with one of his highlight games being a 35-point, 8-assist performance in his first game against Phoenix, which the Knicks would win. Overall, he would hit double figures in 41 of the 47 games he played with New York, as well as 15 double-doubles. 
and Marbury played inspired this season, as he would lead a weak Knicks team to a 25-22 record after the trade, and their overall 39-43 record was enough for a playoff berth versus another former team in the New Jersey Nets. Marbury would lead the Knicks in scoring and assists in this series, but he would also shoot below 38% and commit nearly 4 turnovers per game, as New York was swept. Although it wasn't the most efficient series, he still made his mark, hitting double figures in every game, recording a Game 3 double-double, and dropping a team-high 31 points in a 6-point Game 4 loss. And Marbury's overall regular season saw him average about 20 points, 9 assists, and a steal and a half per game. Over the summer, Marbury would suit up for the US Olympic team, who would become remembered for the wrong reasons, as they were the first US Olympic team not to win the gold since the US started sending pro players. But Marbury finished as one of three players on the team to average double figures, while also leading the team in assists. The Knicks made a good acquisition over the offseason when they traded for Jamal Crawford. Injuries would limit Houston to 20 games in what would be his final season, while Hardaway managed 37 games. So Marbury continued as the team star, however this would be his final great season in the NBA. And at this point, it didn't look like he was going to lead a team to a championship. But he also didn't have much help on a Knicks franchise that was quite dysfunctional during his time there. However, he would play and start in all 82 games for the first and only time in his career, as he would lead the team in scoring and assists, while again finishing as a top 5 distributor in the league. He would also shoot a career high 46.2% from the field, and tie a then career high shooting 35.4% from deep. He would hit double figures in 80 games, which included a 45 point 10 assist performance in a March 29th loss to the Lakers. He would also record 24 double doubles, which included a 17 point 19 assist performance in an April 10th win versus Indiana. The Knicks started the season at 16 and 13, and Marbury's confidence was apparently at an all time high as he would proclaim himself the best point guard in the league. But this claim would haunt him, as the Knicks would go 2-16 over their next 18 games, and overall would end the season at 33-49, and, and miss the playoffs. As Marbury would finish the year averaging about 21.5 points, 8 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. During the offseason, GM Isaiah Thomas would bring in Larry Brown as their new head coach. But the relationship between Marbury and Brown over the next season would change public perception of Marbury for the worse. The 06 Knicks continued adding pieces in Eddie Curry and Quentin Richardson, but they started the season 0-5, and overall Marbury had seen a significant drop in his numbers. Although he was still the team's top scorer and distributor, he was putting up career lows in both categories, yet was still relatively efficient, shooting above 45% from the field. He would hit double figures in 42 games and record just 7 double-doubles, but a shoulder injury would also lead to him playing just 60 games this year, which was also a career low as a disastrous season saw the Knicks go 23-59 and, and miss the playoffs, with Marbury averaging about 16.5 points, 6.5 assists, and a steal per game. Up to this point in his career, Marbury was putting up nothing short of historic numbers, but he was quickly falling out of favor with his coach and some teammates throughout the season. But it got really bad in mid-March, as Brown and Marbury spent about a week publicly going back and forth with insults and criticisms as it initially began with Marbury feeling too restricted by Brown and not being able to play with his usual freedom, which led to Brown calling upon his past history of turning around bad teams. Marbury would retort by making a very accurate statement that Brown tends to go to the media to handle things instead of hashing it out in private, but then Brown would cross the line, suggesting that the Knicks' horrible record was Marbury's fault, which would lead to Marbury calling Brown insecure. And at this point, Marbury was growing less popular among fans and teammates, as he would be booed and left on the bench in the critical moments of an overtime win versus Atlanta. And additionally, teammate Kurt Thomas had reportedly said that he couldn't stand playing with Marbury, as well as reports that Marbury was exhibiting a larger than the team attitude. So after their train wreck season, New York fired Brown as GM Isaiah Thomas took on coaching duties inheriting a team he built, yet one that needed a lot of work, as he had Marbury and Jamal Crawford as his best players, yet also featured another former star guard in Steve Francis, who they had acquired last February due to Brown asking Thomas to make the trade, comparing a Marbury and Francis duo to the Knicks Rolls Royce backcourt of the 70s. Yet Marbury would later suggest that Brown only wanted them to acquire Francis so that he would become expendable and be easier to trade. And even when they had gotten Francis, Brown rarely played the two together. Marbury would have a healthier season, playing 74 games still as a starter, but his assist numbers continued to drop, and he went from shooting over 45% last season 
to below 42% this season. The Knicks would improve on last year, but their 33-49 record wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth, as Marbury's regular season saw him average about 16.5 points, 5.5 assists, and a steal per game. Going into 08, Isaiah Thomas made a trade for Zach Randall, which Marbury was clearly happy about. Did anybody see why yes, Isaiah pulled off yes, for the New York Knicks? That's right. That's yeah. right. Anybody see what he did? Yes, sir. We got yes, Zach Randolph. Yes, so now we got a beast to throw the ball down. Randolph would be a double-double guy for the team this season, and Crawford would play well again. Marbury would see another drop in his numbers, but he was playing through bone spurs in his ankles, which saw him play in 24 of the team's first 35 games before he would opt for surgery, which would end his season. As overall, the Knicks finished at 23-59, and and Marbury averaged about 14 points, 4.5 assists, and a steal per game. But Marbury found himself in another feud with his coach early this season. After a 2-3 and three start to the season, Marbury was informed on the team plane that he would not be starting, which led to him becoming very upset with Thomas and announcing to the team that he wouldn't suit up if he wasn't starting. But he would go one step further and say that Thomas has to start him, because if he didn't, he would blackmail Thomas which was likely referring to some hot water that Thomas had found himself in recently. Additionally, in defense of Marbury, the New York Daily News would suggest that Thomas's decision to remove Marbury from the lineup was a desperation act to make him the scapegoat. But immediately after their terrible season, Thompson was fired by New York and replaced with Mike D'Antoni. Yet, Marbury and D'Antoni wouldn't get along either. The Knicks had signed point guard Chris Duhon going into the 09 season, as he and Marbury would battle for the starting role throughout training camp, which Duhon would win. D'Antoni would tell Marbury that he would still basically get starters minutes just in a bench role, but Marbury would refuse to play for the team altogether according to D'Antoni. Yet Marbury would disagree with this. Because he's showing to me by saying that I said that I'm not, that I, that I said I'm not going to play, and I never said that, that, that that's wrong. You know, I, I, can't, I can't trust that. So Marbury would end up being suspended in late November, while both sides worked on a buyout. As Marbury did not play for the Knicks this season, and a deal was reached on February 24th. Three days later, he would sign on with the defending champion Boston Celtics, where he would appear in 23 games, starting four of them, for a 62-20 Celtics team, who would defeat Chicago in a seven-game series, with Marbury appearing in all seven games, as he would finally make it out of the first round. But they would fall to Orlando in the second round, with Marbury again appearing in all seven games, as his brief regular season saw him average about four points, three and a half assists, and half a steal per game. The Celtics offered Marbury a one-year deal for the 2010 season, but he would opt to sit out. But then in January 2010, he would take his talents international. Stefan Marbury would sign on to play in China, and over the next nine years, up until the age of 40, he would carve out one of the most legendary careers in CBA history. He had his best stretch from 2011 to 2017 with the Beijing Ducks, where he would become a three-time CBA champion, as the Ducks unveiled a statue in his honor after their first title. He would win again in 2014 and repeat in 2015, while also winning the finals MVP. He would finish his career in 2018 as one of the greatest players to ever play in China. Stefan Marbury had a complex career. Like many of the great New York point guards, the spotlight was on him before he was old enough to drive and he was one of the best to come out of New York. His one year at Georgia Tech was more of a formality than anything else, as it just showed that he could handle that higher level of competition, and logically the NBA would be the next step. He and Kevin Garnett looked like they could have been an all-time duo, but regardless of what the true reasons were, it just didn't pan out. Then the rest of his career is interesting, playing for bad teams, yet putting up some of the best numbers at his position, not just at the time, but of all time. And even though he got his wish of leading his own team, it seemed that he likely would have been best as a secondary player, who could play as a primary player when needed. He still put up great performances and exciting highlights in New Jersey, Phoenix, and New York, but everything unraveled in New York, as a combination of not winning and constant feuding changed the perception of Stefan Marbury completely. He finally got to have his larger-than-life experience in China, and overall, as far as his NBA playing career goes, it's one of the most slept on of the past quarter century. As throughout Stefan Marbury's entire career, he could score and pass with the best of them, and the volume in which he did both was extremely rare. But that's it for today's episode on Starberry. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his Georgia Tech alum, or this one on another player who helped put and one on the map.
Thanks for watching and see you next time.